Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another review for you. This time I'm talking episode 4 of Legends of Tomorrow called White Knights. And this is an ep this is another pretty solid episode of the series. It's a nice way to kind of just keep the ball rolling. And uh, it certainly is fun to see the characters running around um, in more of the in the Cold War era again. Only this time uh, they're actually just heading right into the old Soviet Union. Which, um, it feels a little strange knowing that just so many people uh, watching the show are probably a little bit too young to remember this era and um, the way it uh, was really thought of at the time. Uh, here, it's um, basically all your favorite st stereotypes of the Soviet Union uh, on parade here. And, of course, American comics from the time were uh, very big on playing into those, as was... Hollywood and just entertainment in general. But uh, anyway, let's kind of get right into things. Uh, so we were introduced to this new character of uh, Valentina Vostok, who is somebody from the comics, but not not anybody that I'm familiar with. Uh, with her, it seems like they just basically cribbed pretty heavily with uh, from the old Bond girl playbook and just opted for, oh, let's just have her be working with Vandal Savage willingly the whole time. And um, it was it was certainly interesting to watch Ray sort of just out of nowhere develop this little bit of a crush on her, and yet it's just like embarrassing at the same time. It's like Ray, seriously, what, what you're you're being stupid. And of course, uh, Ray being stupid is what one of the major things that causes everything to go to hell in this episode. And uh, that's just on top of, you know, him getting blown off by Vostok and Snart <laughs> completely showing him up once again. But I think that sort of relationship between um, Ray and Snart is one of, going to be one of those things that's going to be part of really, well, toughening Ray up. He's, um, he's a guy who's, you know, had, had his problems, certainly, but he's never really been through this sort of a crucible before. He's, you know, he's had his dark moments, but, you know, what he's doing here, this is going to really require to Ray, Ray to step up and toughen up, which he's not quite ready to do yet. Uh, let's see. What else do we have to talk about? Um, the uh, whole thing with... Uh, White Canary and Hawk Girl. That that's pretty interesting, and uh, <laughs> I just sort of like how this is obviously is such a di another disaster in the making. You know, they're both two incredibly unstable people, and Rip's sort of plan is like, okay, let's just sort of throw these two together and hope they balance each other out. And of course, when that doesn't go so well, that gets thrown in his face, and even kind of admits that this was sort of a crap plan. Although, at the end of the day, it does kind of come around to some degree for the both of them, which is kind of cool. And uh, I do like how, and this is something I missed, but I, I saw other people online pointing out, the sort of blue and um, blackish costume, a jumpsuit that Sarah's wearing, is rather reminiscent of an embarrassingly bad costume that Black Canary actually did wear back in the 1980s. Um, yeah, um... Now, uh, well, let's talk about the characters first, and then I guess I'll talk about some of the more plot detail stuff. Uh, now, this is another episode where uh, Professor Stein really shines as a character. You know, he and Jax continue to have this rather contentious relationship, and, you know, this sort of relationship is very key to the whole Firestorm thing. You know, Ronnie did often sort of resent Stein for we're sort of going like, look, I'm, I'm older and I'm really, really smart, so just do what I say. And Jax flat out calls Stein out on this. And that goes quite poorly. But what's really great is that moment where later on Stein explains like, yeah, I know I'm being a real bastard to Jax, but I have to do this. I have to make him toughen up. I have to, you know, make sure that he survives this because if he were to die, I wouldn't be able to take it. You know, he feels still enormous guilt over the death of Ronnie Raymond. And he just even flat out says, I just could not survive losing Jack. So it's a case of, 
if I have to be cruel to be kind, then that's what I'll do. And, you know, that's a very interesting and very telling thing about Stein's character. And it also is kind of a flaw for him. He's rather than just level with Jax about how he's feeling, he's going down this whole road, which is um, not going to end well. And as we see in this episode, it doesn't end well because he tries to take on too much, more than he can handle by himself. And again, it, uh, it blows up in everybody's face. Um, now, I, I definitely did like, again, Heat Wave in this episode. It's, the show's really doing a nice job of slowly and subtly fleshing him out as a character. And this time it's by basically pairing him up with Rip Hunter. I mean, he still gets the, you know, I still get to set, set stuff on fire, right? But when he has that moment, it's like, yeah, your friend is totally trying, going to try and kill you. And he turns out to be right. You know, thankfully, Rip listens to him. You know, it shows that, uh, again, whatever his flaws, Heat Wave knows his way around things like this and does genuinely have something that uh, of value to contribute to the team beyond being able to wave around a flame gun. And again, this also really just solidifies that uh, there's there's no going back for Rip. It, it's He's all in on this one. And again, shows that uh, the Time Masters are willing to be utterly, utterly ruthless in regards to this and that they are basically indifferent to the suffering of humanity that Vandal Savage is going to cause. Apparently, if it's humanity's destiny to be ground under Vandal Savage's boot for God only knows how long, then so be it. So, that again provides just fresh motivation for Rip that yeah, there that no, nothing I do, nothing I say, even after everything that's happened, is ever going to get these people to change. And there really is no going back for me. Even my closest friends have turned on me, and the only people I can rely on are these nutcases. So, um, let's see, what else do we have to talk about? Uh, I think that kind of covers the, the main stuff there. Um, so let's talk about a few plot things. Now, did you notice that um, when um, Vostok had kind of turned the tables on Snart, when she's talking to Ray, she also mentions the name Professor Stein. So apparently she overheard them talking, or Snart let Stein's name slip. It's like, uh-oh, the Russians know the name Professor Stein. There obviously are going to be enough witnesses that a uh, you know police sketch artist kind of sketch could be easily obtained, and then it wouldn't be terribly difficult for them to just sort of like, okay, let's see, American physicists, assuming, that, yeah, I mean, they're all speaking Russian at this point, but they're going to assume that this is an American operation. That's just how things worked in the Cold War. Okay, American physicist named Stein looks like this. So, probably guessing that 1980s Martin Stein... Well, actually would probably just still been a guy in his 30s. So, yeah, that uh, does kind of buy him some leeway, but... Hmm, okay, guy named Stein. Kind of pretty strong resemblance working in similar fields. We should go totally take a closer look at this, this Martin Stein dude. So, yeah, it'd be kind of interesting if this all led to, like, you know, Russian 1980s Russians trying to kidnap 1980s uh, Stein or something like that. But uh, probably giving the show a little too much credit for that one. Uh, now, another thing that I think they might bring up at some point, though, is uh, Kendra did basically claw some dude at the Pentagon's face off. Uh, would not surprise me if they didn't decide to bring that guy back at some point just sort of really rub it in her face. You know, yeah, at that point he was just some random soldier, but, you know, bring it back to the present day when almost 30 years have passed and he could be somebody of pretty high rank in the military. Ooh, that's bad. And <clears throat> then there's the whole situation with um, they're trying to create a Soviet version of Firestorm. And, I mean, this is just such a cliche from... Uh, 
80s comics of like, oh, the Russians are trying to create their own version of our superheroes and stuff like that. And yet, given the era, that's absolutely the kind of thing that would happen in a superhero universe. So, as cornball as it is, it's fitting. And, um, yeah, as stereotypical and cheesy as um, Russian super, character, super beings or superheroes or supervillains of the time could be, uh, to me, somebody who's familiar with that era, there's nonetheless a bit of a charm to it all. It's just um, the way things were so long ago, <laughs> even though it was basically a pretty scary time where a lot of people thought nuclear annihilation was basically inevitable. Yeah, Cold War was not a fun time. And, um, let's see. Yeah, I think that covers everything I had to say about this episode. Uh, again, a lot of it's kind of set up for, obviously, the big payoff stuff next episode. I kind of like a little bit more of a the occasional done-in-one from this show. But, you know, they, they got only 16 episodes to work with. They really want to make everything count. And if they're going to continually space things out over one or two episodes, eh, that's something I can live with. Uh, anyway, guys, that's all I had for you this time around. Uh, as always, please comment, rate, and subscribe. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Hoosier Jedi, and please join me on Tumblr at Jedi Reviewer. Till next time, take care and have a good one.